Welcome to Speaking Cinema Series Movie Jibber Jabber Movie Podcast, broadcasting to you live from the Golden Garter in Deadwood, South Dakota, California, planet Earth. We are Speaking Cinema. We pick a motion picture, talk about it, how we feel, what we know, then we dive deep and watch it. Finally, we come back, talk about the movie, all for a contextual conversation for the only thing fit to podcast movies. Follow us on social media at Speaking Cinema. Listen to us, Jibber Jabber, every single Monday. Obey, rate, review, subscribe. Help others find the show. It's a fun show. We have a good time. I have a good time. Our, our, our handful of fans, they have a good time. Ha- hey, the, the, More than a, the, two big handfuls. Approximately two million uh, fans. Of exactly. Two million of you. That, all. No, no, a million, look, a million's a handful. Yeah, a, mi- a million for you and a million for me, but they don't like each other. There we go. Take it to the Reddit forums, guys. <laughs> I am your host, Doc Jibber Jabber. Hosting me today, here with me, as always, is a wild Kevin Merritt, the Spokane Kid. Hello, Kev. Hey, boy howdy. This week on the Jibber Jabber, we're concluding our Grab by the Girly season, season 12, a curated season by the ladies. And, uh. Season 12, we're getting into like cheers status here. I mean, you know, there's a certain. And probably no one in the world finds this funny, except for me. But there's a certain, like, because we don't take any breaks and seasons are arbitrarily length. You know sure. what I mean? There's just different themes we want to do. Yeah. So it's like, you know, it's the 12th season, but it's not like we're doing the 12 years or not like that means that it's, you know, 10 episodes a season, so it's 120 episodes. It's like, it's all random. Yeah. So. Because we, we make our own fucking. Which I find to be very entertaining, and I don't think anyone else understands or uh, cares. But, but it doesn't matter. Our, our rules, our podcast. I'm the center of the universe, bro. When I close my eyes, the whole world goes to sleep. Wow. Deep. Yippee! It's the Bonanza and a musical extravaganza. This time on the Jibber Jabber, Warner Brothers, sky highest, smile widest, wild and wooliest western of them all, 1953's Calamity Jane, our penultimate movie, and what weird things I just said. Penultimate is second to last. It is it now? So yeah. this is the ultimate. Yeah. The ultimate movie. <laughs> yes. A little, a little uh, grammar lesson for you all viewers out there. Hey, Penultimate. You know, second this, to last. That's what we talk about. Movies. We talk about grammar. We talk about politics. We talk about movies. And then we talk about race relations. Yep. This is our martini shot movie. What? The final shot. Speaking of grammar, what is that? Oh, this is Latin. Yeah, from, from the set, you know. The Abbey Singer is the second to last, and then the Martini is the uh, the last shot. In, in my day. limited oh, of the day, not of the movie. Sure, oh, okay. sure, sure, sure. Because then you're gonna get a Martini. Exactly. <laughs> uh, which, um, in my limited time on sets, no one ever accurately judged that. Like no. this is our Martini shot, guys. Yep. Oh, we got it. Okay, well, what we got time? Why don't we get one more? Yep. It's like, I think uh, we're not on the same page right now. Exactly. Yeah. It's also, like, relative to, like, who's going, who gets to go home and who has to say and clean all this shit up? Yep. Spoiler alert, it's the PAs. Cause, because, yeah, <laughs> when you're a PA, it's like, it's like this is someone's martini shop, but there's no martini in anyone yep. here's future. There you go. Load that truck up. All you get is stale Gatorade and a yep. kind bar that you ate half of in the morning. Clammy Jane, directed by David Butler, written by James O'Halloran, starring Doris Day, Howard Keel, and Alan Ann McClary. You know, for someone who has such a hard name to pronounce, you know, Mr. Jibber Jabber, yeah. um, I really, really suck at it. That's why I can't get <laughs> mad at people. It's like, you know, I'm not good at it. Your, your true last name is, it's a mouthful. So Yeah, Jibber Jabber. You know. Produced and distributed by Warner Brothers. If you're not familiar, in Deadwood, Dakota Territory, Indian scout Calamity Jane heads to Chicago in an effort to save Henry Miller's saloon from ruin, but bringing much-admired, beautiful Chicago singing star Adelaide Adams to perform in Deadwood's premier entertainment venue, the Golden Garter. Arrived, the lady in question becomes Calamity's best friend, singing, and hilarity ensues. Calamity Jane. Wow. What a plot. (sighs) Hmm? What a plot. Yeah. Get ready for this shit, Kev. Sounds fun. Yeah. <laughs> the way the Old West wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to get to that in one second. This movie is loosely based on the life of Wild West heroine Calamity Jane. 
It was devised by Warner Brothers in response to the success of MGM's musical Annie Get Your Gun. It was being made at the same time Fox was making Some Like It Hot. There you go. Facts. Said to be Doris Day's favorite movie of her entire career. Wow. That is a a long career she had. She said... She's quote, still alive. Did she's you know still that? alive. 94. And, and was a big Bush supporter. Ugh. That's too bad. Well, in, you know, in retrospect, it's not so bad. Yeah. And also, you know, <laughs> in the 2000s, it, it was a weird time where uh, people lost their mind. And there was lots... There's very little forward momentum in terms of, like, progressive thinking. Yep. Which is weird now because we have uh, we have a lot of regressive ideology and progressive ideology. So it's a weird we're in this weird flux where there's it seems to be like the, you know the regressives feel suppressed or oppressed so and suppressed oppressed and suppressed and so the suppressed feels suppressed they and are oppressed. they are striking back. So everyone it's weird we live in a world where everyone complains that people complain, but everyone feels like they're entitled to complain. Yep. So and we can't see and we can't see <laughs> that that similarity, right? It's like and what's the weirdest thing is the people in positions of power. To me, the weirdest thing is people in positions of power looking at people who are not in positions of power and saying, "Why do you complain?" And it's like, "Well, you understand yep. that I am not in a position of power, and I don't. And you know, are you surprised that I wouldn't like that?" And they're like, "No, don't complain. Bizarre." They said about this movie, I had a great time working, I had a great working relationship with my co-star, Howard Keel. Um, she loved portraying Calamity Jane, who was a rambunctious pistol-packing prairie girl. She said she lowered her voice and stuck out her chin. Yeah, so she, she just loved this role. She just loved, and, loved jutting that chin out. Huh. That's, that's good. And she, I guess she said, this is a weird quote, she says... I can't say that the physical hijinks of jumping on horses, bars, wagons, and belligerent men or doing platforms and muddy streams seem to be particularly exhausting. So is that a fancy way of saying I enjoyed those things? <laughs> That's, there's a lot to unpack in that quote. Jury is out, Kev. Jury is, is out. Uh, yeah. So AFI, the American Film Institute, very much a fan of this movie. Uh, nominated in numerous when they do these lists of things. Yeah, yeah. So, 100 Years, 100 Passions it was nominated for. 100 Years, 100 Heroes and Villains for the titular character of Calamity Jane. Uh, 100 Years, 100 Songs for Secret Love. And it was nominated for their greatest movie musical. So, uh, a lot of great attached to this movie. Sure. Won an Oscar for the song Secret Love. Emily loves this movie. Grew up watching it in her teenage years. Discovered it on VHS. Very good. From your local library. The way it was meant to be seen. Go to the library, kids. Uh, known in the gay community, gay community, as having deep lesbian undertones. So, Kev, look for that. All right. I'll keep an eye out for that. Um, I mean, uh, the real Calamity Jane was thought to be a lesbian, but also worked as a prostitute. And also was right. supposedly in love with Wild Bill Hitchcock. And We'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. We'll get there. I, got, I got some Calamity Jane knowledge to drop. As of this recording, you find this movie on disc, streaming, digitally, favorite DHD platform. Look for it. It's there. It's it's readily available. Kev, what was your first experience with this film, if one even exists? One does not exist. I was never really aware of this movie. Mm -hmm. Nor am I very aware of the career of Doris Day. I know who she is, but, you know, if you told me to name one of her movies, I couldn't. She, I feel like she's a... From our position in pop culture, she's someone who is referenced... But we don't know. Do you know what I mean? Sure. Like sure. in that Grease song, uh, when they're making fun of Sandra D, they yeah. reference Doris Day. Doris Day. And uh, I remember listening to a <laughs> an interview with um, the guy who directed American Werewolf in uh, London. John Landis. And he's like, uh, they did the, the Blu-ray restoration. He's like, they lighten it up to the, a point where I'm like, guys, this is a horror movie. Yep. And they're like, well, but we can we can show everything. And he's like, I don't want it to look like a Doris Day picture. There and, you, go. you know, it's like, I'm like, hmm, look up Doris Day. And we'll find out what that means. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I watched this movie before at the behest of Emily, friend of the show, and was definitely caught off guard. In what way? Uh, it's a Doris Day musical. I, but again, like we just said, we're not familiar with that. True. So I was like, I don't know what this is. And then she was like, this is great. And I didn't know what to expect. It's a musical and a Western. That, that's an interesting combination of things. Sure. 
Um, and, and okay, so uh, this is, I was just we could dovetail it into what you said earlier, right? So you you said uh, the West and how it wasn't. Yep. And musical uh, musicals and westerns, we like those separately, but together. You know, The Simpsons made fun of it famously in that, you know, Paint My Wagon Red. Uh, Hail Caesar makes fun of it with Lazy Old Moon. It's interesting because one is thought to be elegant and one is thought to be gritty. Western in musicals. Sure. Um, But the Western is a sub-genre of the medium of film and it can be expressed for a lot of different things, right? Sure. You see... It's been used in every genre. Right. There's... It's sub-genre now. There's... Uh, we just we did a horror western, Bone Tomahawk. Right, great movie. We did a, <laughs> a, up for debate. Uh, there's revenge westerns. There's it, uh, there's just like there's, there's very, comedy westerns. Comedy westerns, yes. Blazing Saddles, of course. Right. There's very westerns can be very xenophobic. Yes. They could be very the nationalist. Searchers. They could be the ve- searchers. <laughs> right. They could be they're, they're and then you have something like uh, Dancing with the Wolves, which is about white guilt associated with the yep. West, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so there's you, a you have a movie like Unforgiven, where the outlaw is the hero yeah. of the story, right? And the sheriff is the bad guy. So you flip roles that were traditional. You got Tombstone, which is a, as close to. Like a traditional action movie, western, right? And 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 thematically, that movie is about how this has to end because you can't live lawless. We, yep. The uh, the romanization of lawlessness is just that the romanization yep. of it. It's not real. We have violent, insane westerns, The Wild Bunch. <laughs> we have video games, Red Dead Redemption, mm-hmm. possibly the greatest game ever made. Real weird beginning into that game. That's all I'm gonna say. What? It, what you have a shootout, and then all of a sudden you're like walking around a farm picking flowers yeah, and riding horses. You gotta start from from bottom and work your way up. Yep. So it's so it's interesting because you know you say like how the West wasn't, but if we were really to unpack the West and we look for the truth, right? It's like what kind of person? And in film, it's the adventurer. To answer my own question before I even ask the question. What kind of person would leave literally civilization and go to a place that has no law off of the promise of getting ri- filthy rich? Right? And now, and now this somebody is our, either very ambitious or somebody completely insane. Right. So, this is my California bias because we had the gold rush. So, that's what you learn about in school. Sure. So, it's like people came to California specifically to become millionaires. Yep. And not that many people did. I don't, in Washington, what do they teach you about the Wild West? As, um, we did a lot of stuff with like Lewis and Clark because they came through that territory. Um, so yeah, that was kind of a lot of our sort of Wild West stuff. More we, explorer, exactly. Yeah, we had yeah a lot more of the you know it's like these, this river was traversed by Lewis and Clark and all these other explorers. And, and like, now this was in our, and and where they made landfall on the other side now. Is the parking lot of the Arby's that closed down Pretty many much. years ago? <laughs> um, in the history of the West, it's it's a lot of it's like you know it's a lot of you know frontier stuff. People who are running away from things, people who are running to things, you know lawlessness. People who can take advantage of other people, right? Oppression. So uh, we were up in Alaska a while ago, and they're talking about how people came up for their gold rush up there, and it's like they say like something like it was like a hundred thousand people came up during that time you know during the whole period uh-huh. and it's like seven of them made money wow. and the rest of them didn't make anything <laughs> Jeez. you know and they're like that is, that is a high fail ratio and uh, there's a town up there I don't remember the name of the town and what was the name of that town what what was the name of the town in Alaska that was like the wild west ghost town Skagway. so there's a town ta- there's a town up in Alaska called Skagway where they said that this the as the piano player <laughs> so they had a guy come up and he was like you know writing about how terrible this town was Skagway it was like and it was a, a town of prostitution and murder and he's like you as a song would end in the saloon as in the pause between the song end and the next song beginning you would be entertained by the music of someone in the street begging for help <laughs> Wow. So it's like, you know, we romanticize. We, there's a weird nationalism and xenophobia of how we view the West, right? As this, like, very happy-go-lucky adventure when it's like, you know, 
the West, securing the West is part of the genocide of the native population here. Securing the West is part of the Catholic mission system, which was abusive in its own right. You know, uh, so it's like... But then, you know, who, who's like one of the great conservative idols? It's like John Wayne, right? Mm-hmm. He embodies everything that people thought the West was about. But really, he was a guy named Percy who lived in Orange County. You yeah. Know? Same with Ronald Reagan. It's like, oh yeah, he played a cowboy, and boy, that's just we did it right out in the cowboy west. It's like, yeah, he was from Simi Valley. <laughs> <laughs> so the American in me appreciates the myth of the West sure. for what it is, right? Adventure, shenanigans, you know, horse riding. Making your fortune. Yeah, yeah. Making your fortune. Being, uh, what, what do you call it? Uh, collective independence. Yes. Etc. The other American side of me is like, this is a place where, I'm sure terrible things happen to terrible people in ways we can't even fathom, and it was very, very bad for many people. You know what I mean? Yep. So it's a tough, it's a tough thing to to weigh your head around. And then the other part of American in me, yeah, just is like you know. It has to be a mix of this. You know what I mean, mm-hmm. right? Or maybe it's not. Maybe that's just a lie. And it's just there's there's the film representation that has nothing to do with reality. You know, truth is just a lie agreed upon. Right. So there's there's probably a little bit of truth to some of the bigger personalities, Calamity Jane, mm-hmm. Wild Bill Hickok, um, Seth Bullock, those kind of people were had their you know Jesse Jesse James or whatever had their big moments. Yeah, they were just people suffering like anybody else out in the wilderness. Right. And not to uh, spoil this for you as you have not seen it, but, you know, it's like you look at Monty Python and they're they're having fun with the Crusades, right? Which is, yeah, yeah. if objectively, is not a fun part of history. It's a very disturbing part of history where many people were, innocent people were murdered in the guise of, you know, heresy, witchcraft, yeah. claiming land, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, right? So it's like, why can't why can they do it and this is a happy go lucky musical so why why can't you put that spin on this right now it's not hysterical we're gonna have to get into it and 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 uh we're gonna have to explore how it goes so what are your expectations going to this kev you know it's my first doris day musical let's see what it's all about um i'm gonna carry a little bit of a crux on it though one of my favorite performances across any medium of all time is robin weigert as Calamity Jane of the show Deadwood. She is brilliant in that part. And she's going to be the Calamity Jane for like millennia to come. So when you say that when she called someone a cocksucker, you're like, she meant <laughs> that, that. That's the nicest thing she said to anybody. Because if you see her in other shows, she's on like Jessica Jones and other shows like that. She's the in the bones of that character. Like it is, she is steeped in... The, like, sadness and toughness and dirt of Calamity Jane. And just the stories you hear about her, it's like, that's probably close to who she actually was. Mm. So, and whenever anybody talks about what I think are underrated performances, I always point them to Robin Weiger as Calamity Jane. I don't love narratives that this person is this character. Because the character, you know what I mean? Because, like... Oh, yeah. that, that- I, they're, they're actors. They're just, They're doing their thing. Sure. And, like, we see this all the time with the Joker, where it's like... Oh, yeah. This person is the Joker. No, now this person is the Joker. Oh, how dare he take the role of the Joker? How dare he take a job offered to him? Yep. Because he should have offered it himself, a, a production that he does not control, to the guy who did it last time, who doesn't want to do it. Yeah. Jack Nicholson with Heath Ledger. Uh, Heath Ledger. Yeah, yeah. He's a Jack Nicholson. I was, I was so upset they didn't offer it to him. It's like, hey, old man, you want to make fucking comic book movies? Shut your yeah. fucking mouth. Yeah, you're, you're Get out of here. Also, I love Jack Nicholson, but come on. I love him, but You're yeah. owed nothing, man. But yeah, 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 exactly. So, the last time I watched this, I was in a happier place in life, Kev. Uh, it was called uh, pre-Trump... I'm not even called Obama's America. It was just pre-Trump America. <laughs> and, um, and the movie caught me off guard, and I kind of wasn't looking at it with a real critical sure. eye. I was just kind of like, well, what is this movie? Okay. Now, in terms of critical eye in terms of beyond being a movie. Sure. Right. So, and I enjoyed it as a movie. Spoiler alert. So this time I'm, I want to look at it and see what the change in the world has changed to me who has changed the movie. Sure. As any great film would do. Yes. Changes you change. So, uh, let's get into this. Dig in. Here we go. Here we go. Don't touch me, motherfucker. And 
we're back, Kev, we're back. We're back. Kev, as this season closes, one of my many joys of this season, and we talked about this in the last episode, but I'm going to bring it up again, is that I have no idea how you're going to take these movies. <laughs> and uh, Clueless, we liked. We kind of... Really was, liked. Split on here from Eternity, but then now I've kind of turned my back on that more. Um, you know... And I was looking, I was watching this movie as we do, and I was watching the first couple of moments of the movie, right? And it's just like, dum 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 dum, whip crack, whip crack, yep. dum 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 dum. Whip. And I'm like, I just don't know how this is gonna go over. You know what I mean? Because it is, this movie lives in its own bizarre world. For sure. It's a bizarre, it's a bizarre movie, and you, when you say that, you expect like Tetsuo the Iron Man, and it's not art house bizarre it's just like it has if you're not here it's it's a moving train it's and but it's not on a train track though it's like there's no tra- it's a huge train no track blistering down the fucking road down yeah, off the road it's a ghost train it's a ghost train of a movie so um kev that being said what do we think it's not bad it's a fun movie Although I have some qualms with it. Main main qualm, I wish it was fictional characters. I wish they didn't try to use <laughs> Calamity Jane and Bill Hickok and like people that actually existed and have a rich history to kind of make a dorky musical. I, dorky. Dorky. I, <laughs> <laughs> I really like this movie. I think there are a lot of really great fun, 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 fun things about it. And I agree. Um... Some stuff I want to get into that's a little bit more troubling. But on that note, I do feel like this movie is using the Western and as such using the characters of Hickok and uh, Clamity yeah, Jane to referentially, right? So if there were new characters, it would be like, well, she's going to be a Calamity, Calamity Jane style character. It's like, why not just make her Calamity Jane, right? If her name was Dangerous Betty and he was... Uh, Madman, you know, William, whatever, Hitchcock, right? It's <laughs> the same shit. So they're like, why, why, sure. why not just use the iconography of these characters? So I get what you're saying, and, and, and you, have a, uh, you have a much more appreciation for the, the historical versions of these people than, say, I do. True. Um, I would argue that's why they did that, but there's merits to both of these things, right? Sure. And I'm sure there's lots of people out there who think that she was a blonde, skinny blonde, beautiful woman who could sing really well and yeah. fell in love and married Bill Hitchcock after they went to a dance somewhere. You know what I'm saying? Like, you always take that risk. There's a weird responsibility when you make movies where it's like, you have to remember that dumb people will watch this and smart people who will have a moment of dumbness will also watch this movie. Sure. Right? There's always going to be that person who thinks that people in ancient Samaria spoke English because they did it in a movie. Yep. And it's like, no, that's for the convenience of the audience. You yep. know what I mean? Exactly. So it's... Uh, I'm not going to name any names, but there's someone that we know who's, who said that in our in me and his collective childhood. And oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> it's like, no, you idiot. <laughs> <laughs> I got to say this first. Off the top, Kev. Off the top. Sure. The songs in this movie. The songs in this movie are fantastic. They're a lot of fun. They I are, know. and that's, that's what, exactly what that's my that's next fun. sentence was right here. They are fun, and they do. They're fun, and they do what music is supposed to do. They further the plot while giving you a fun piece of entertainment, right? Sure. So, um, and I'm impressed at how a lot of these older musicals, the numbers kind of take place in one set, mm-hmm. maybe two. This one will have one start in a stagecoach, go into town square, go into a ballroom, big thing in a ballroom, end. Right. And it's like, that's and that's then, pretty impressive to like, because, you know, you don't film those consecutively. It's like, okay, this is day 10, and we have to do the middle part of this song, so you got to remember exactly, like, how you're going to get from point A to point B within each stanza or set piece and I thought that was really impressive right because so. you got because to into cl- I mean just to give an example of this the opening song the beginning of the song is a back is a rear projection on the wagon yep right and then she's on top of the wagon she climbs into the wagon kind of you know and the, all the people inside are singing and then they show up to the real set and they continue the song and it's like 
yeah, in your mind, that's a seamless cut. Yep. But in reality, that was probably two consecutive, two different days, two different places. Yep. Right. One was a back lot. One was probably in the studio. It wasn't like we're going to pick this up tomorrow from this point. It's like days could have gone by. They did all the reprojection probably all at once. Yep. And there's a couple of reprojection scenes in this. Multiple. So, yeah. That's a great point, Kev. Yeah, I, think, I thought that was something that immediately leaped out to me. Mm-hmm. So, because a lot of modern musicals do the cross cutting, like Chicago and Sweeney Todd, but nothing where it's this steady, like huge one story scope set yeah. piece. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I thought that was really interesting. And this is no, and in terms of the songs furthering the plot, this is no better personified than in the Black Hills song when they're going to the dance. Yes, and. They start singing, they, you know, Calamity and Wild Bill, they, you know, they, they, they have their relationship. It's been the same the whole time. And they start singing about how much they love the Black Hills of Wyoming. And it, it's and the way that they're looking at each other, it's the beginning of their relationship. South Dakota. South Dakota. <laughs> it's, all, it's all the same shit to me. Ooh, though. it is right on the border, though. So, um, well, yeah. then I almost didn't make it this time. <laughs> no, so I like, I did like that a lot, where it's like, it's the power of musicals, right? It's like, when did they fall in love with this movie? During this song. And it's a song, so it's very emotional, and you can believe it, because the song takes you to that place. You yeah. know what I mean? Um, and there's a couple of times in this musical where they sing two numbers back-to-back, and oh, how delightful it is, right? It's like, done with this song, right to the next song. Right to the next one. Or go, keep going. Yeah, all this, this soundtrack is... Eat, a your, real... eat your heart out, La La Land. Ooh, eat, eat, you, you eat your hearts Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I also feel like this movie is is a is a musical comedy right we talked about the musical part and it is a comedy oh absolutely and it's fucking funny it's It's, pretty good bro it's a little dorky it's a little it's it's definitely it's definitely family entertainment for the whole family but but there's definitely there's like uh, so like when they're looking at the picture of the girl the cheesecake photo of the girl you know she's like She's a side of beef, and I'd look the same if I didn't have my ideas of modesty. God! I did like uh, when she goes to Chicago, and she's she is uh, completely bamboozled by the idea of a girl with a huge ass and a girl that might be a lesbian. <laughs> lesbian overtones. We're going to get into that. We're gonna, I want to get deep on that in a minute, but... All right. That was like not the least bit subtle. That like she bumps into the one girl, and then the girl's kind of like, "Hey, man, hello." Hey, you out. And again, it's a, it's it is it's not okay in our modern era, right? It's not subtle as, but you can explain that away by well, she thinks that calamity is a boy because she dresses like yeah. a boy. Is it dressed funny? Oh, bullshit. But yep. uh, <laughs> I also say there's It's like it's, This is an era Where people didn't realize Liberace was gay So I thought he was just Very British He just <laughs> He just couldn't find The right woman You yeah. know <laughs> Out there in Vegas It's tough uh, I, Just to wrap up My funny things There's funny lyrics too Like she's When she's talking About the town And she's a You know He's a very good friend Of mine You know bah, yeah. bah, bah, bah. And then When she's talking About Wild Bill Cock He's a very good friend Of a friend Of yep. mine yep. It's that extra little friend So good yeah, it's, the lines are very snappy. Mm-hmm. You know, it's clever lyrics, good wordplay. Again, fun set pieces. I like the one where she's dancing in the hall and they're like lifting her up into the balcony. Yes, and yes. Like and very physical. Physical. physical Indeed. Yes. And in a way that it's like, ooh, this is irresponsible. Like, there's, she owes a spa- sarsaparilla and then she falls, falls off the bar and it's just Doris yep. Day taking a fall. Like and she just splats ball, on the ground, right? yeah, plat- yeah. And then they then they're lifting her onto the bar, up to the second story, back down, and it's like, yeah, they're really lifting her up. She's like jumping off the stage and getting caught, you know. Yeah, you don't. You when you think of a physical movie, you usually think of an action movie, mm-hmm. or you don't think of a like goofy comedy musical as being super physical. But this one sure is hell. And I, and I appreciate it for them pushing the boundaries on that. You know what I mean? Sure. Like explore the whole space. You know. Mm-hmm. Uh, also, I love. There's a moment in this movie that I always love, where when when they bring the fake uh, uh, Adelaide Adams in, you know, she can't really sing or whatever, yeah. and everyone starts to get really mad, and she gets up there to defend her, and someone stands up and she just gives him a front kick right to his chest and sit, puts him back in the chair, yep. and it's like Doris Day fucking kicking a guy, <laughs> yes, you know, it's a tiny little blonde girl just like yeah, sit your fucking ass down, you nice. know, I love it. Uh, all right, I'm ready for lesbian undertones. I just want to get a comedy thing out of the way. Sure, sure. I wrote down every time I saw one. So you're ready okay. for this. Ready? 
Um, oh, and I should say, I should say, we are not lesbians, nor are I mean, we gay. Some, nor... Somewhat by definition, we're lesbians. <laughs> well, we're not women, unless I there's know. something you want to tell me I know. about I mean, your gender, I mean, how you see yourself. Facetious. So this is straight male's interpretation of something his gay friend told him after he saw the movie and didn't notice it the first time. Okay. Me. Uh, so um, you, Kev... Found the first one, obviously. The, the, the big city lesbian. In Chicago, she sees the big the big butt, and the big butt is the thing here's the thing. She looked at this girl's big butt and there's like a bass drum under yeah. the butt. Boom, 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 boom. And so it's that's selling you on the idea that she is like, whoa, yeah. you know? She's, check, she's looking at the butt. And then someone else checks her out. Yes. So that is an interesting thing. The second time she enters the dressing room, looks at fake Adelaide Adams, Katie, eyes her. And says, gosh, you're the prettiest woman I've ever seen. I didn't know a woman could look like that. And her eyes bug out when she sees her. And she's oh. in, like, her, like, um, onesie, like, yeah, she, sexy sequin. It's kind of a corset-esque thing. Yeah, yeah. she's wearing. Um, and then we move to when she's going to move in with Katie. And then there's there's some stuff where she's defending her to all the, the boys and stuff. And then there's yeah. also that line where she said, you know, I would look that way if I didn't have modesty. But that's that doesn't, that's not really a lesbian. But there's a sexual overtone to that. Then so she's going to move in with Katie and Bill's eyes bug out and he says, oh, this is going to be intriguing, right? Now, that's very subtle, right? Sure. Without the first two, that doesn't really add much, no. right? Um, but then when Katie gets out of the wagon, when they get to their little shack, she's helping her out mm-hmm. like the way that like, we've seen men do. Yes. Right? Where like she gets out lady. first and she's, she's like, you know. Yes. And then here is the biggest one of all, Kevin. I don't know if you noticed this. Was it the scene where they scissored? Uh, that was the wrong movie. <laughs> You're watching... The... That, that was Come Lamity Jane. This is uh, the, uh, Calamity Jane, the porno parody. <laughs> Come Lamity Jane. Uh, Calamity talking to Katie about Bill. Okay. And she says, My taste run to sp- my sparkling taste runs towards blue uniforms and shiny buttons. Right? Which is what... The other guy is Buffalo Bill's wearing. He, yes. he wears a blue like, army uniform with brass buttons. But Katie's wearing, wearing a blue dress with a blue jacket with rhinestone buttons. Yep. Yep. Les ends. So it's interesting. And then they live together and Calamity discovers her feminine side and starts dressing like Katie. And then by the end of the movie, now she's dressing in what ostensibly could be her old style of you know, pants and a shirt, but they're much more feminized, sure. right? Yeah, and her yeah. hair's peeking out the front. It's not a coonskin cap anymore. It's or, or the navy cap. It's like a like a yeah. western style hat, you know, cowboy hat, if you will. So it's interesting, right? She goes from butch to straight womanly when she's living with a woman, and then and then back to a kind of a mix of those things. Sure, they're so, definitely there. And they're definitely there on purpose, I think. There's no way it's not what they're implying. Like, now, there's not a whole lot of other ways to take it unless you're completely naive. And I th- I just think that the, the blue button thing is just like... That one's right she, there. She had other jackets, Toby. She could have taken that jacket off before that line. Yep. No, That's it, right there. It's right there. It's right so. there. Um, dot, dot, dot. Let's talk about something that I think plagues the Western genre in general. Let's talk about a little bit of racism here. Yep. Now, so, I will say I was surprised. I thought we were going to get some real overt racism in this one, like what Mel Brooks parodies in Blazing Saddles. Wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be, but it's there. Okay, let's, yeah. talk, let's talk broadly really quick. Are there any movies that you can think of that are, other than like Bir- the original Birth of a Nation, that are like... This race is bad, and this race is good. The way that, spoiler alert, a lot of people feel in this country, yeah. right? Yeah, they do. Um, I right, you said Birth of a Nation. Um, da, 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 da. I mean, I can't think of anything. I, I feel like I'm, I'm sure there's I'm sure there's media out there that I mean, the vaudeville is kind of like that, but I'm sure there's a lot of media out there that exists that portrays this, but it's not in the lexicon, right? Sure. And it's interesting because you listen to how people talk behind closed doors about how they feel about any group. Women, racial groups, religious groups, anything, right? And you you hear the things that they say, and they're these terrible, 
broad strokey terrible things yes but we don't often see that in movies at least not to my knowledge right you see what you see more is like the su- more subtle version of this right um you get what was just the norm of the time yes in there and so you get a lot of movies and we still see this now where the woman is a damsel in distress women can't help themselves men need to help them right yeah. but it, no one says women can't take care of themselves because they're too fucking weak you just show that yeah and no one says it. so there's a scene in this movie where she's uh shooting out with indians also the the, the betrayal of everything in this movie feels like the, like a little kid like also those indians are totally mexicans <laughs> <laughs> Listen, if we go down that rabbit hole, we'll never get out. But yes, you're right. But so she's um, she's uh, she's defending the wagon against Indian, and she's just like, "Oh, you red skin varmint!" Blah 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 blah, blah. and it's pretty racist. Yep. You know, it, it is tough to watch. They're dropping some slurs in there. Yeah. So, um, and this is a, this is a common trope in, of racism in America in media in the western right it's the idea of the fierce savage warrior indian who is in the way of progress yes and even buff the real buffalo bill said every indian this is the real buffalo bill every indian outbreak i've ever known has been resulted from broken promises and broken treaties by the government and even though he said that and even though he felt that way and even though he had indian friends and, and hired indians to be in his traveling circus show in the traveling circus show they were always the antagonist yes so there's this, and it's exactly what you just said. It's people say these things, and it is a reflection of the time. It is. You know what I mean? So now, then the debate comes up, and I think it's a very wrong debate. I'm going to tell you why. Where people say we should go back and take that the stuff out. I agree with you. I agree with you. Continue talking. So Warner Brothers made this movie. I was watching the Looney Tunes DVD once. Bless your heart. You know, this is classic. We were classics. doing it was something in uh in film school. We had a Looney Tunes thing. I don't need Nick. Have I don't need any excuse to why you were watching Looney Tunes. Watching I Looney Tunes. Lo- love that Looney Tunes. As you know, there's some questionable content in some of those Looney Tunes. Some jive talking uh, uh, crows. Some, some uh, straight up blackface from Bugs Bunny and Mickey Mouse from Disney. Warner Brothers put a disclaimer on on the front of it. But it's a really interesting one. They say, you know, some of these cartoons depict racist imagery. They said it was wrong to have those prejudices then. It's wrong to have them now. But to censor it would be the same as saying those prejudices never existed. So if you're to try and scrub that history and say, no, it's all nice. Everything was fine. We go along with the Indians and the... And the black and, and, and quick complaining because it it's, okay. over. it's over. It's yeah, over, right? It's over. So you, civil rights went in the way of of minorities. Well, what happened to all those racist people? They just said, you know what? I know when I'm bested. Yep. Shit, put it there, pal. Yep. You're one of us now. Didn't happen. So, and the way that they that you what you just said and how you just said it and your you know from how they said it is the most elegant way to put that and and in my opinion the complete truth, right? It is wrong. It's not any it less happened. wrong now. Yep. But to say it didn't happen that's, that's is worse. worse. And that's what I like about... I don't like that scene in this movie. I don't like that scene, right? Where she's sure. saying these things. And it's a character that up until that moment I find to be very charming and fun. And then gets very gross right then. Yeah. And... But it is a record of how casual that racism was right and I, people you know they tell you that you know yeah it's like what, what do you what do you what are what are women's all complaining about what are these different groups complaining about you know blah blah blah, blah. and it's like yeah but there's never been an apology or a a any kind of you know any kind of thing to say hey what what was common then was wrong you know what i mean and so there is a culture of like we're not going to talk about it we're kind of going to softly deny it and i like how this is a time capsule of how it existed exactly and yeah it's it is uncomfortable to watch those scenes Mm -hmm. you know again i thought it was going to be a lot worse as some old westerns are real bad using dropping some s words and such but again it's a time capsule 
and it's we can see like this was accepted in like a goofy musical this like very casual racism Mm -hmm. and this you know this whole manifest destiny thing yeah this this is happy-go-lucky version of calamity jane killing people who are (laughs) who have they have invaded their land and she's doing the full manifest destiny thing right and that's kind of hard to reconcile with right you know? and it's tough because I, I now back in that day it's like yeah Calamity Jane she's a cowgirl just like just like me you know and totally and okay so to to, to to compare then to now right what's the refrain we always hear and in this last Super Bowl we heard this talking about uh, human garbage Tom Brady <laughs> the people the refrain don't get political. Don't don't be, talk sports. Yeah. Don't talk politics. Yeah, right. Stick to sports. That's Which really bad. means yeah, stick to sports. Exactly, Kev. Which means don't challenge the status quo. It's not. We don't get mad at people when they say when they defend the status quo. We only get mad at people when they challenge the status quo. Right. So when Tom Brady, def, you know, when people defend the way it was, right, that's normal because that's way the way it is. To suggest change is to be radical, right? Yeah. Even if that change is necessary change. Mm-hmm. And um, people were like, don't talk about how the New England football club owner and the star player are friends with the president who, who advocates practices that would, uh, you know, who, that, that would... Openly t- racist. That are openly racist, that, that are prejudiced against legal citizens, right? The team's called the fucking Patriots. Yep. That is, that is political. You, how can we... You say don't talk politics... Your team is political. It's the Patriots, right? And we have a team called the, the Red- Redskins. Which is which there's just nothing anyone can tell me. That's that is deplorable. You know yes. what I mean? It's a slur. Right. It's used to demean. Right. Calamity Jane uses it in this movie. Oh, it's a demeaning term. So I was talking to I was talking to Emily, friend of the show, about this, and she's like and we're t- and she's like, Could you imagine in nineteen fifty because she's a very smart girl, so she's you know teaching me some shit yeah. so she was like in 1953 Jim Crow America could you imagine how people w- felt about these things don't challenge the status quo right like yep. we are trying to take back our culture like they don't like there's not gonna be sympathy you know what I'm saying I'm saying like we know it was not right then but just to but just in context right people don't want to talk politics now think about how much now is different than then so you could totally you know, in, that generation just got out of World War Two, right? They don't. They want to sit at home and watch a dorky musical, right? You know? Or go go to a movie and watch it, movie theater. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, so it, it's just it's just. I mean, we can. I don't. I don't buy into these narratives of like, oh, that's just the way it was, right? Because we've always known this is wrong, and there's always been a sentiment of the population who knows it's wrong, and they have been shushed by everyone else who's like don't challenge the status quo don't be political whatever so you're at, but so I'm not defending this movie but asking it not to to be a, a bastion of, prof- of, of progressive ideology in 1953 Jim Crow America is unrealistic sure and I appreciate and again this this was the institutionalized idea that's just like that was just okay right back then and yeah you can't retrograde and fix it to make it Exactly. This thing, because right. then you're George Lucas, right? Exactly. <laughs> so I do, I I do think that a lot of, outside of the interaction with the natives, there's everything is to like in this movie, exactly. Right? But yeah, we and can't wait watch that. I can't deny it, and I won't deny it. And I won't want anyone's intelligence by denying it. And yeah, I think it's again. I don't think this movie is nearly as bad as some other westerns, but it's there, mm-hmm. and it's. It doesn't completely taint it. I still think it's a pretty enjoyable little movie, but it's there. And for, it's a ward on that face. And for anyone, if yes, it is. And for anyone who complains that people are too sensitive now, people talk too much, anyone can say anything on the internet. In my research for this movie, no one mentioned any of this shit. Nope. You know what I mean? It is everyone loves this musical, and they do not acknowledge that element of it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, I don't know. It's a. Uh, so other than that, Kev, is there anything in this movie that doesn't work for you? I mean, and, and a, not in a nitpick, on a big level. On a big level, let's see. Again, I say... I talked about how... I, for me, I'd prefer if they just used fictional characters. Okay, whatever. Back then, they probably didn't even know 
there was still the legend of Calamity Jane. Right. probably didn't have nearly the access what we did. Okay, it's fine. The plot is a mess. <laughs> I mean, that's my thing, too. Okay. This movie okay, good. Is, is, it is all over the place, but it is a delicious mush of just, you know, we're trying to save the Golden Garter. It's like, is that what this movie's about? We're trying to get a man. Is that what this movie's about? We're trying to have this lesbian secret. Is that what the movie is about? Is it about sing? Uh, who knows what this shit's about? The line that confused me the most and seemed the most out of place, is, this isn't the exact line, but it's towards the end and everybody's kind of turning on each other a little bit and somebody says something along the lines of that Calamity Jane just ruins people's lives we haven't seen her do that <laughs> at all in this she's just this happy go lucky staging little musical numbers kind of person that everybody seems to just adore See, I and think... then all of a sudden yes they we're supposed to instantly believe that she's this bad person who's a burden and like oh, ruins people that's, that's because that's because Katie's leaving so they're blaming her for Katie leaving. Yeah, but, I but think, they, the way they talk about it, it sounds like, oh, that's just Jane, old ruining lives calamity Jane over here. I think um, I think it's like when you're... I, I interpreted that line... I know what you're talking about. I interpreted that line as because when she's when she's helping them, they, they all tolerate her, but they do think of her as a weirdo. So I think once she, quote-unquote, betrays their trust, they just turn on her completely. So I do think I do think it's a purposeful overreaction, right? Okay. Like our sexy dancer's gone. Like you're the worst. You know what I mean? <laughs> and it's like, yeah, all right, come on. I don't know. Yeah, it's the the tone shifts at the end are kind of abrupt and not really earned at all because it's it goes from like happy to sad that fast. Definitely musical logic. You know what I mean? Sure. Lickety split. Yeah, it's like she sees. Katie kissing the guy and then immediately it's like their friendship is over but and then all of a sudden everybody turns on calamity but then everybody's happy again it's it's a real hot spot <laughs> uh, I, I will say also the, the gunplay in this movie is just so irresponsible uh, very much so very she, much shoots so. A, she shoots a glass out of a guy's hand but she's on the stage and it's like that had to hit someone behind him yeah so <laughs> that, that's ricocheting off of somebody it's John Wick level sh- we're shooting through a fountain <laughs> blindly like what are you guys doing um, a little nitpick. Gun belts, how can that be comfortable? Have you ever worn a gun belt, Gav? I have not, no. Um, Seems like it'd be heavy. Seems like it'd pull your pants. This is what I'm saying. It'd be heavy, it'd be always pulling on you. Because yeah. like, those old pistols are heavy. Yeah, like shit. Iron, pure and, iron. And if you got two of them, that's real heavy. So, yeah, that would be viciously uncomfortable. Um, any nitpicks for you? Um, nothing major. Uh, yeah, nothing really too nitpick. I, Almost anything, I can kind of just run with it being like, this is just a musical, you know, it's, you kind of, it's fine. And it, and like you said at the top of the podcast, it really does live in its own little bonkers world. Right. And which I think from the first, the first frame, it's sending you down that road. You yep. know what I mean? Like For sure. It's very, this is, it's a world that only exists here. in a movie. Right. In this thing. Um, And I will say, Calamity Jane and Wild Bill Hickok... I mean, fuck me if there's those names are just ice cool, cold, awesome names, right? And they were real. Like that's, that's what a moniker to earn, Calamity Jane. They say that. It might Although there's a rumor that they, she self appointed that name. So. There's a rumor also that that's uh, Calamity was a, uh, a VD nickname. Oh yeah. So like uh, herpes or whatever. Yep. <laughs> herpes Jane. There's a there's a catchy name. Yeah. <laughs> so um. I, and I'll just say, last thing I want to say is that the movie is very well made. There's a really great show not tell scene where they, when they get to the ball and Calamity takes off her coat and Will turns around to put his coat on and he turns back and he doesn't see her because now she's wearing a pink dress uh-huh. and then she turns around and his eyes bug out. It, it's a really great moment. Like, you're in that yeah. moment with them. It pulls you in. Yeah, for sure. And yeah, it's, it's well shot. It's well edited. Um... You know, the only things that really stand out are some of the rear projection. It's like, okay, that's a rear projection. It's, right. But, again, you give it a little leeway because it's in this own little world. And so. it's not It's not so... It's, you it, doesn't tell, ta- it doesn't take you yeah, out of the movie. You can tell what it is. It's not offensively, like, sure. garbage rear projection, you know? It's just yeah. like, you know, all right, whatever. It's not like room-level green screen on top of a roof. Right, kind of, right. Because this is San Francisco and not a parking lot. So... <laughs> That is, you know, it's not that offensively bad. So. Mark Damon. Um, 
use. Uh, <laughs> if we get on the room, we'll no, never. This podcast will never cool. end. It's, this will be a ten-hour episode. Uh, future episode coming up. Uh, we had our crazy fan theory, which is a lesbian undertones. Yep. And how how being bisexual helps her find her balance in her life. Is there a would you see this movie sequelized or remade? Oh, I think you could do a sequel. Um, you know, just get another batch of well written songs. And you got to call it Clammy Jane Rides Again. Clammy Jane Rides Again. Some something easy, simple. Um, I think you can dig into. If you really want to do it modern day, you could uh, really dig into that lesbian relationship. Yeah. And let's. <laughs> I was kind of thinking. So many movies about lesbians are depressing. Can we just have a happy lesbian movie okay. at some point? Okay, okay. You stole my pitch. Because my pitch was, how about she goes, finds this girl, realizes that she likes this girl way better than these dudes, and then just yeah. gets with them. And it's just a happy-go-lucky musical. Yeah. Well, And then the, the climax of the movie is when Bill finds out that she, he's like, my, your heart's already taken. And he's like, I won't get in the way. Yep. <laughs> I think it could totally work in the modern day. So, big picture, I like this movie. I think it works. There is some overtly racist stuff, but we can appreciate that for what it is a time capsule to another time. Yes. And it, it is isolated to a couple of scenes. It's yeah. not like... It's not just a constant presence of like, oh, them dang redskins have gotten the fort. And you bam, can, bam, 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 bam. And you can really... The most offensive scene... I mean, the scene where they, 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 they steal uh, uh, Buffalo Bill... And then she goes and gets him back, and it's like it's almost as if it's like it's like a, a child's view of what war is. Like yeah, you took the guy, and then I came and scared you away, and I took him back. Yep. And so then the mo- so then the most offensive scene, which is when she's going on her racial tirade, you can cut that scene from the movie, and it doesn't hurt the plot of the movie. Yeah. We shouldn't, but you could. For which sure. is good. Yep. You know what I mean? Yeah. And because it's not about conquering the West, it's about finding an entertainer for the Gordon Golden Garter. Yeah. It's yeah. It's not. And then kissing her soft lips. Mm. It's, yeah, it's not a dark western. It's not dark at all. Yeah. It's, and yeah, it's not about, like, the west. It's just about this town that's already established, Deadwood. And yeah, it, it, it could very easily translate into, like, a Muppet show or New York or somewhere like that. Where it's, it's a save the theater movie, you know? Or at least that's one plot in the many scattered plots in this mess of a movie. Mm-hmm. What a fun mess. Fun, yeah. It's one of the few, yeah. That that plot is completely bonkers weird, but, like you said, it's a, it's a fun mush. And they're just not, they're just not afraid to throw in the kitchen sink, you know? And it yeah. works. It's not like it doesn't work. It's just, like, when you, if you had to recap everything that happens in this movie, it's like, oh, there's a lot, you know? Yeah. I think that's something, people that really miss old Hollywood, I think that's the thing they miss, is the big kitchen sink approach. Like, every movie has to have everything in it you know I think that's what we do now but what the things are are different things sure there's a mystery there's a twist there's a big explosions there's a shooting there's a weak love story that's what we do now yep you know what I mean always a weak love story there's a beam of blue light that goes up to the heavens <laughs> blows up the world but yeah I think particle it's, effect yeah they never they still don't quite you know don't want to say it but they don't make them like this anymore they, do, they don't make. They don't make. Worse. They don't make them. They don't make this anymore. We don't make westerns. We don't make musicals. Yep, that's true. And if although, we did, although, it'd be real depressing. Although we've got a musical looking to sweep the Oscars here. Yeah, soon, indeed. So. Might make a little comeback. Well, um, we'll see. We'll see what happens. I think what people realize is musicals are very hard to make. Yeah, it's tough. This episode written by Mr. Jibber Jabber, music by Jeff Russell. That's it for us. Come back, listen to us next time. This is it, Kev. We're going to start our next season, which, spoiler alert, will be our... We got a new director buffet coming up. Who's going to get served on that buffet? We're going to find Oh, you're going gonna... right, to... Well, yeah, let's keep it a mystery. Yeah, why not? Let's keep it interesting. Why not? Somebody's, somebody's getting served up on that buffet for a nice little run. Serve. Service. Bing! We are Speaking Cinema. Hit your wagon and meet us in Chicago. We'll be there.